So, man, I have a million questions. So I, I'm very curious how an, a John Wick movie is actually made. So I want to go back in time. It is the John Wick 3 comes out, big hit. Lionsgate calls you, I guess, or there's a meeting and they say, we want to do a fourth. Mm -hmm. What exactly happens there to get to the screen in terms of, you know, how are you crafting your action set pieces? How, where are you thinking about, you know, like locations? Can you sort of take me through sure. how this all got figured out? It's, um, yeah, I wish it was a little bit more systematic, but it, it does happen like that. You know, the movie comes out, it does a certain degree of success. You get the call, you have the congratulatory Zoom call, oh, good job, we're awesome, it's great, it's, we're woo -hoo. Um, Then you get the, well, what do you say? And it's kind of a joke. What do you say? Uh, just jump right back in and you get the next one and you're just like, because <laughs> like you, you feel all this weight and pressure on you. Uh, it's not that you don't want to. It's just like, e okay, what do we do? And they, everyone starts trying to plan and like, it's hard to plan an idea. It's like, you can't just go Tuesday, five o'clock. We're going to come up with good ideas. <laughs> like it doesn't happen that way. So I, I, I get kind of resistant. I'm like, yeah, I'm not ready to talk about that yet. And like, and they just kind of like, well, well, and it's like, no, you're not hearing me. I'm not ready to talk about that yet. And you, you <laughs> hang up. <laughs> and then it was probably four and a half, five months later. Uh, in Japan, they released a little bit later. We, we've always had a delayed release there. So Keanu and I, we haven't seen each other in a couple months, and everyone's done other projects or something like that. And we'll get on the plane. We'll head over to Japan, like we're going to do on this one. <laughs> sure. And then I think it's twice now, but on John Wick 3, we're in, in the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. They have a brilliant scotch bar there. And Keanu and I are like, yeah, fuck, that was a rough one. Let's, let's, let's not do that again. Yeah, let's not do that again. That was... Um, good while it lasts. Good while it yeah, was good. Good experience. Great experience. It was great. Great, great, great. Yeah. No, no, it's good. It's done. It's really, no, we can rest now. It's great. Don't know if we can do that. We're, we're getting older. Yeah, no, it's great. One more, let's have one more drink. Okay, yeah. I got an idea. And that's how it always starts. And we're like, we love Japan. We're like, wouldn't it be cool if we did an Osaka Continental? Like, yeah, it would have been cool, but that's that's done. And at the time, I, I literally think I had watched Good, the Bad, the Ugly on the way over. I was like, I got an idea. Let's have three. Like, you know, we did the John Wick story. Let's let's see the world from different perspectives. Let's see it from the high table side. But we'll, we'll do we'll, a new sheriff in town. We'll do a Western. And at the time, I was also super into Zatoichi. I'd watched like 10 in a row, right? And I was like, yeah, we got to have a blind swordsman. He's like, blind swordsman? I'm like, yeah, I'm blind swordsman. And I had also just watched David Lean's, like, you know, Lawrence of Arabia. I'm like, we got to go back to the desert. We love Morocco. We got to go to Aqaba. Aqaba by land. <laughs> like, we just started drinking and laughing, like, Aqaba by land. No, blind swordsman. Nah, fuck you. We're going to do it in Osaka. Asa Samurai. Yeah, that'd be great. Bows and hey, you ever shot a bow and arrow? Let's do bows and arrow. And they were like, wah, John Wick with nunchucks. And you start ripping these ridiculous ideas. And they all go into this little notebook that I carry around. Cut to, we get back to LA. I'm like, Maybe those were good. And you go to the whiteboard and you start going nunchucks, and that's all you have. And you write Lawrence of Arabia, Aqaba, and you circle it. And then you go, oh, trilogy, character, uh, you know, good, the bad, the ugly. You know, we'll have a blind swordsman meets a guy that's a tracker. Well, I got a dog. We'll put a dog. And you start drawing these circles, and that's kind of how it started. And then we didn't have an overall plan, overall plot, overall story. We just knew. John Wick has to realize what he's done. Like he's, we keep talking about consequences. We got to see real consequences. And John Wick has to learn, but he can't just say, I've learned and I want redemption. You got to see the pain on his face because we're a show, don't tell kind of movie. So we wrote this scene and ended up being the Hiroyuki scene on the roof where there's that one great line, one of my favorite lines of movies, like friendship means little when it's convenient. And that's when it hits John like, well, he's actually burden somebody like he somebody's going to pay the cost of it until rena tells him you don't understand what you've done you because of your shit my dad's going to pay an innocent in this and that's we just want to keep hitting keanu's character with that so we knew that theme was there like how does everybody john bumps into he kind of he kind of screws up a little bit because he keeps putting this burden on him. john wick shows up at your door john doesn't think of the burden he's putting on you and then halfway through the movie we wanted john to realize like oh fuck yeah this is a bad thing i gotta do something good and we had to make him earn that by actually, you know, letting him take the bullet at the end for Donnie, that kind of thing. So we knew we wanted that theme and we knew we wanted nunchucks and dogs and cars. And it's funny, I actually, I, I, I've always been a fan of like some of, of, of Joe Rogan's podcast, but I, I ended up bumping into him at the gun range once. And I was like, hey, how are you doing? And I'm the guy that does, he's like, I'm Joe Rogan. I'm like, yeah, you know. And he's like, he didn't even miss a beat. He's like, what happened to all the muscle cars? Like, where are the muscle cars? 
<laughs> I'm at Terry and Butler's gun range and we're just shit. And he keeps giving like, I love muscle cars, man. Like, great movie, but where are the cars? <laughs> so I wrote in the notebook, put muscle car back in. Joe Rogan hates me. And, uh, you know, we're like, okay. I'm like, Joe, what car would you put in? <laughs> Excuse me. Like 71 Barracuda. Didn't miss a beat. 71 Barracuda. I'm like, all right, 71 Barracuda is going in the movie. And then you figure ways to put that in. And I think that's a lot of how we do it on John Wick. The overall creative process starts with this giant whiteboard. Like I've told you before, we put down all these ideas, good, the bad, the ugly, Leone, Zatuichi, you know, one car, why, use reds more. I don't know, that, they just came up, we're like, in the mood for love, uses reds well, makes sorrow, put red more in. And it starts like that. Um, my dad's a plumber, or was a plumber, uh, and that was his business. And I remember when I was very young, I saw one of these water curtain things happen, like it came on and off, and it was ch 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 and you're like, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And use that, so you do a little research, and I'm like, oh. 40 years later, I'm putting water curtains in 44 waterfalls in a dance club to, to techno music. And I just thought, like, that's how it starts with all these ideas. Then you go to, you know, what do you love? Uh, I, you know, I want to be back on the horse. I think John Wick needs to tie it together like this. I think we need to include all three films and wrap them up. And he looks right at me and doesn't miss a beat. And he goes, John Wick's got to die. Like, John Wick has to die. I'm like, whoa, you want to kill a character? He's like, I didn't say John. I said, John Wick, John Wick has to die. He has to, has to. Like, that was our whole, we got to hang our hat on that. Like, we're going to just... Fuck it, don't care who's upset by it, we're gonna, we're gonna do it. Like, okay, well that's how we'll start writing the story. And we wrote backwards from that point on. To get there, like, what's a deserved death? <clears throat> what makes him think he's gonna take that bullet? And that's how we went back every step of the way to design the scenes. And it kind of gestated like that. As far as action goes, um, there's a couple of scenes we or scenes that we had written that we cut out. Like I'd love to do an underwater sequence, or like a thunderball. I wrote down like one of the earliest thunderball beat beat thunderball do underwater spear gun sequence with John Wick style. <laughs> You're like okay, how's that gonna work? So I went actually to Lanai and I went to this famous dive spot in Hawaii and went down underneath the to cathedrals they call it. And you know you sit underwater, you wait for the light to hit, it, and at 60 feet it's this mo oh, Okay, so I'm gonna shoot at cathedrals. I'm gonna shoot in Hawaii. We're gonna get 60 stunt guys and we're out through thunderball. <laughs> so that went in the script. Um, and it was supposed to be off Malta's coast and stuff because we had this Knights Templar idea. And then we're like, snowmobiles in the city. Snow. Blood looks cool in snow. So do a lot of snowmobile stuff. And we're like, we had a snowmobile chase in it. We're like, okay, that didn't. <laughs> and then you're like, Arc de Triumph, gunfight in traffic. Boom. And we started reverse engineering that out. And all everything I'm talking about, it seems like it comes up. But that, that right there is about six months. I'm just screwing around with scenes and story. No script, just we'll write a scene. Like we wrote the Lou scene very early on. We just loved the idea of being in front of the wrath of Medusa and the cost of tyranny and, you know, have this French thing. We knew we wanted to call the guy the Marquis. He was the new sheriff in town. Like, you know, it was like high noon. We wanted not a high table member, but we wanted, you know, who, who, who's the sheriff? Who's going to clean up this mess? Who's going to come down and lay down the law? And we're like, we're going to call that guy the Marquis and he's going to have this little sheriff's badge. <laughs> And that's why you see the pin in the movie the whole time. Like, you know, you're the new sheriff. Here's the, here's the thing. And, you know, we kind of took a lot of the John Ford, Leone, Western vibe and mixed it together with Asian cinema. And that's how we kind of got the vibe, which is really like the first half of the movie. So I'm curious, what is it like to go into the studio and say to them, so we're going to kill them off in this movie? Um, got a lot of faces. We got a lot of... <laughs> it was, I mean... I. I have a very good relationship with Lionsgate. They're great. They've been very supportive. Um, but I, I don't think any exec or any producer in the world would smile when you say you're going to kill off their successful franchise character. Um, so there, and again, I, but you know, I, I, I try to like, you know, and you want to have that confrontation, like, look, this is what's right, but you got to see it from their side too. And you go, yeah, like, you know, I'm the guy that pitched, you know, nine years ago, Hey, I'm going to do an action. We want to start by killing a puppy and I'm going to shoot 80 people in the face over a puppy and I'm going to kill Alfie Allen and then that's it. Oh, but the bad guys kill his wife. No, she died of a disease. Like that's a hard pitch. John Wick never pitches well on paper. You know, like I'm going to do ninjas on motorcycles. I'm going to like, it doesn't read well. So when you read, yeah. And then John Wick dies and gives his life for this. And you're like, what? Wait, wait, back up. What? So you, you try to understand the, their perspective on it. And you're like, look, I get it. It's in the execution. Like, it's going to be a longer movie. It was a 135-page script. We knew we were going to be in the two, half, two and a half hour mark at least. And we're like, look, let, let me give it a go. And I, I want to do you a solid. Like, we have this duality thing going on, John and John Wick. So like, look, you, whether you look at it or not as 
John Wick's dead or John and John Wick are dead or it's a split and maybe one's off somewhere on a desert island, whatever, however you want to interpret that. But, you know, let, let, let me try. Let me try to execute it. Let me try to execute it the way we are. Let me build the story around it. And I'll do you solid. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll shoot the ending two ways. You know, with one extra little thing, two extra little shots, I'll, I'll tie in John. I'll, I'll let you know he's alive and I'm going to leave it up to the honest to decide. And we're going to test both. And they were super cool. They let me go through the whole movie. They let me, you know, encounter or devise a whole script based on this ending of the character kind of thing, his demise. Uh, his death and why he dies and that's really what what the movie's about and i'll do it two different ways and we tested it and we all looked at it and uh, you know the 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 test audience has definitely had had a favorite of that which is the the ending that you guys saw and it was nice to show the student get actual feedback about like you're right like this is really strange but it it misses the punch it misses the ending and it makes the whole movie worth it you know, in, in a cathartic kind of way to, to end like we did. And everyone was very understanding of that. And it was it, it was good to come to that conclusion together without having to fight it or force it. And as you can see, obviously, they're, they're, they're supportive of the ending, the, the kind of one it was. But it, it, it wasn't an easy sell. It, it had to be proved. And even I, like we felt it was the right direction to go, but you don't, you don't know until you sit in that room with three, four hundred people and you really feel it. Do you think that everyone was in a good mood, though, because John saved another dog? Do you think that also helped elevate the score? Yeah, I'll take whatever I can get. If that if that was a little bit of a emotional manipulation, that could have been in the hair. I'm not going to say. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take what I can get on that one. <laughs> uh, so for people that are going to, because I'm sure there's going to be people that ask, is John Wick a fish? Like, in your perspective, he is dead. I think, um, again, uh, not to be evasive, We've always seen, like, this has always been a campfire tale, right? It's, it's meant to be a myth. It's not meant to be a movie. It's not meant to be a sto- or plot. It's meant to be a little bit of tale, a fable, right? And fables are always interpreted because the ending is always up, like, what are you getting out of it? What's, what's the moral of the story? So we're going to treat this like, what's the moral of the story with John Wick? Is John really dead? Well, John Wick is. I mean, that's his redemptive story. Now, does that, the myth of John, the character of John in his little world, did he find a cool way to end that, that chapter so he could start anew somewhere else in a different life? I don't know. That's an interesting concept. I'm going to leave you with that one. You know, my personal opinion is is probably a little bit darker than that. But, like, I think that's a very open to interpretation kind of thing. And we kind of wanted it that way. So if this was a, a Greek myth, you'd kind of get like, okay, it, it doesn't really matter which side of it died or if he died as a human being. It matters that the John Wick persona died. There is an after the credit scene. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you decide on that scene? We, it's funny, like we shot that. There's a real scene that goes along, like Donnie coming up. You think he's got it, and then Rena goes and gets him, and then there's this whole death scene with Donnie and dying. Like we had a whole thing where you actually see the demise, but like it was a little, it was kind of a bummer. But like, I, not that we like John Wick were hardcore, like kill them all, you know that kind of thing. And but we watched, and I kind of felt like, well, that's. That's not as cool as not knowing, like, does Rena go down that road? Like, you know, we have John Wick and his demise, and we are, well, let's open the door to the new John Wick. Like, who's the new? And we're like, Akira. You know, she's got the motivation. She gave John the ultimatum. John chose not to honor that, but he chose to honor something much bigger. So we had this whole scene, and we're like, well, that doesn't really say what we want. It was a little too much, and we didn't think it was really nailing it. So we're like, well, my editor, Nate Orloff, had an nice idea. I was like, what if we don't see it? What if you leave the audience to that? What's the choice? I mean, as a choice, she opens a knife, but does she actually, you know, hit Kane with it? And we're like, that's awesome. Let's just try it. So we put it at the end. It's like, okay, we want to be a little, you know, hard-boiled in our, in, our, in our filmmaking with John Wick. But at the same time, I don't know. Let's leave it open. Let's see what a choice. And it had that little bit of, all right, that was cool. And it had that little punch to it. We're like, not too much, not too little. And you still don't know. So did she go down that dark road or did she go... Oh, not my battle. Okay. Uh, with this being the last chapter, um, have you, and it might be too early, but have you had conversations with the studio about doing a special John Wick box set of in finding extras you have on the cutting room floor, hmm. all there's that been, stuff? There's been a little talk about it with marketing and stuff. I think their their main focus is trying to get the movie out there and do their thing. But um, Josh Oreck's company, Narrator, has done a great job. I mean, they have hundreds of hours of behind the scene footage and training from all the movies from very, very early on. Um, I think there's talk of doing a little bit of a special, like an hour special or featurette, which is literally all four movies, 
you know, from the beginning, he's kind of tracking, you know, from my younger days to what I look like now and to Keanu and how we all limp now and all that. So I, I think it's a very interesting. They show me some of it and it's very, very cool. Um, hopefully they'll tie that in with the whole marketing scheme, but I, I would love to see it just for my own interest. Um, and I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, the video game world, the anime world, and, you know, hopefully the TV world. Yeah, um, I I really am wondering why there hasn't been, like, an amazing John Wick, you know, um, open world kind of game. Mm. I think they were just waiting for the right opportunity. And, again, I think people always trying to play. You don't know if you've got something you want to invest in until it does well. By the time it does well, now you're, you know, a three-year leeway to get to the game develop. So I, I think... Um, Lionsgate in general kind of knew they wanted to go down that road. So I think for the last couple of years, they have been working very intently on it. And I think they're moving forward with something right now. Uh, yeah, I need that. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. The four John Wick movies have spectacular action. And each movie has a set piece that is, it looks impossible to pull off. Right. So I'm just curious, how would you rank in the four movies? Like, what do you consider the, the five hardest sequences <laughs> that you had to pull off? Wow, good question. Good question. Um the concept we use to go like a little trick for all the choreographers out there. It's very easy to come up with easy ideas. Does that make sense? Yeah. Open space. There's nothing in your way, so you can you think you can do anything. You know, we'll clear out the room. Don't don't, don't want that table there because then I can't do my spin hook kick. And the the opposite is actually true. The more obstacles you put in the way, the more interesting the choreography is. Think of Jackie Chan. Like you and I can do a, a decent fight scene, but if I handcuff us together, yes, it makes everything harder for both of us. It makes it harder to shoot. But if you nail it, it's 10 times more interesting. If you want something more interesting, be subversive, show it in a different way. That's why we do the different lighting, the different things. Like Marcus Aurelius, right? Stoicism, the obstacle is the way. I learned that from Jackie Chan very early on. I said, how do you, he's like, make it hard. If it's easy to choreograph, don't do it. I go, okay, that's a, sorry, super bad Jackie Chan impersonation. But like, he, he always wrote, make it as difficult as you can. Like, of course you, you, but then you're like, well, how do I, you're not supposed to know because you haven't done it yet. So make it as hard as you can. And the interesting part is how you solve it. It's not the problem, it's the solution. And the true judge of character is how you solve it. So the choreography should always be uh, this inclusion of obstacle or, or, or hardship and how you solve it, that's what makes it memorable, right? Like, it's always like that. So you take that with the scenes and like, look, w yeah, you, w it's not hard to put car stunts and fights together, but it is hard to execute. There's a lot of, there's a reason people haven't done that before, because it's hard. <laughs> so we're like, all right, well, if that's our model, let's see how bad we can screw ourselves. Let's say dogs, cars, people, and like, let's just try to run anybody over or kill anybody, and let's put it all together. Or like, let's try to do an entire 100 move sequence from the top. I move camera in a tiny little space over and through walls, and let's, but wait a minute, that'll take thinking, you know, well, Okay, let's think. And I, I think that's a challenge. And it, it'd be funny, the smart creative people, the more challenge you give them, the more they get turned on, the, the more they get inspired, the more they want to work hard on it. So if you had to have me rank all that, um, every sequence we do has some little hint like that. Some we can afford bigger stuff, some we can't. I think out of the four, the most logistical where I was like, okay, please don't mess this up, would definitely be the Arc to Triumph sequence just because I, I have a, my lead cast member as good as he is in a car, he's driving against five lanes of traffic. If any one person messes up at 35, 45 miles an hour, that's never a good thing. Like movie, non-movie, we've made it as safe as we feel good. Can't spend all this time driving. We have the best stunt drivers. We've coned off. We've come up with all these safety factors, but things can, obviously it's moving vehicles. Things go wrong. Um, and then you have your lead actor with, with Marco, our other lead, you know, running through five lanes of traffic. Like you do not, and that's a, those are real buses. Those are real cars. Like, <laughs> you do not want to hit your lead cast with a tour bus. Always goes in bad column for directing. Don't run over lead actor. So that 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 was every time behind monitor. And you're like, you don't ever want to get real in stunts. You never want to get relaxed, even though you got the best and you've done it. It's your fifth day of shooting and everything's gone off hitch. You never want to just get complacent. Go, ah, oh, you know, we've been doing it. Like, you can't ever like. If I'm not stressed out over a sequence, I get nervous because that's when you get lazy. And when you get lazy, that's when you make mistakes. So you got to be switched on. And after two weeks of being switched on, it's, it's, it's a little exhausting. And I, I guess 
it's nice to see that it all comes together, but you don't know that to the end. So you're like, did I just risk all those people? <laughs> did I just do all this work not to get a good sequence? But you don't know to the VFX are in, to the cars are in, to you edit and the music's in. You're like, okay, it was worth it. So that one was definitely in the top five for sure. <clears throat> I would put the top shot in there, just logistically trying to figure out, okay, how are we gonna do this? Like, there's so much math going into where you have to put the camera, the camera to subject, how do you get one lens to do it all without cutting and all that stuff. Um, mirror room in number two, very difficult. Just, just like, how do I, we had to put each of those mirrors on a 10 degree tilt swivel so we could always hide camera because we couldn't afford visual effects at the time. There's like two or three visual effects wipeouts, but most of it is we had to hide camera people and crew with little angles. And just, you want to think about, like math is not my strongest subject. And you go going to figure that out. Um, another top five would be the Halle Berry in number three with the dogs. Uh, dogs i mean as well trained as they are it's dogs and they're the dogs don't know it's a movie so they're they're biting crotches <laughs> they're they're going for the target and you just hope that they bite the target and not the person holding the target um that gets a little stressful you know you get hallie and there's so much going like no one's ever done that with dogs before no one's had 50 stunt guys and your lead halle berry shooting guns and all this stuff and the dogs jumping over people and like literally biting and taking down stuntmen like that's a real animal going at its fastest speed, being its most ferocious, taking guys down, like that's, that's not a stunt, that's a real event, like that, you know, that's not fake, that's, those dog hits are real. You know, obviously when you're hitting guys with cars, or you're doing like, that's, you know, gravity works, that's a thing, physics are real. You know, that's not, that's not fakery, that's, you know, we're, our best guys getting hit by our best stunt drivers with, you know, 2,000 pounds of metal. That always makes you go, okay, so those car hits in the Arctic Triumph are real, those dog hits are real. So what do we got, Arctic Triumph, Top Shot, the Halle Berry sequence with that, and um, what's the other one? Um, <clears throat> oh, our mirror room was pretty tricky. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Fifth, what would that be? Um, wow, I mean, the waterfalls are always tricky with the club. We've talked about that. Like, that's always a logistical nightmare um, when you deal with so many extras and stuff. But, um, God, I, I, I think... I like putting you on the spot. Like, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. It's making me think. You know, the horse chase in Brooklyn on number three was a little, little, little tricky because you don't know how that's going to, is that going to be look really, really ridiculous or is that going to be cool? <laughs> um, you know, fighting with a sumo guy, fighting with the, the, the glass house. I mean, they're all tricky, but like uh, for myself, what was, I didn't know it was going to work, um, and which is, I think is the best fight for number three, which was the knife fight. And it sounds like, oh, that one didn't look that hard. I, I think conceptually it made me nervous. Because in every movie, you see a guy throw a knife and it sticks in and it kills a guy right off the bat. And that whole purpose of that fight was to be completely subversive and go, yeah, knives don't always stick in. And what, what does a snowball fight look like with, with knives? And I think conceptually, we're all nervous. Like, this is yeah, we're going to work. People are going to think this is ridiculous. They're going to think he's terrible. So I was a little stressed out about that one. Um, executing it wasn't that bad, but conceptually, I was like, ah, I'm either going to hit or miss with this one. It's either going to be the coolest fight in the movie or it's going to be the weirdest. So I'm kind of happy it turned out to be to be good. I definitely want to talk about the Paris stairway sequence. Mm -hmm. um, I think people... They put that one in the top six. Yeah, well, first of all, the sequence is crazy, but for people that, that maybe think that this is all, like, you guys use, like, CGI and stuff like that... Oh, those are real stairs. That's actual sacre -cure. Yeah, exactly. So my thing is that are these people that are, uh, go, you know what I mean, going down the stairs... Mm -hmm. and Real guys, all real. No yeah. effects. effects. Um, how exactly are people getting up from that? <laughs> the stunt guys, we, we did a great, uh, my stunt team, we did a great job putting together a, a multinational stunt team on this. Great martial arts stuntmen, great fight guys, and great um, call it physical gag guys, fall guys, basically. And, you know, from the 8711 team to our Japanese team to our Par Parisian team to our Bulgarian team, just really great guys. And technology advanced so much, like they use gel packs over hard elbow pads. We have this almost Kevlar level. Um, padding body armor that we can put under the gel pack. So the guys can withstand in, but you still have to go down the stairs and get hit by the yeah. car. But it keeps the edges off a little bit. So it, it, it does help. Um, but it is still going down 100 steps. Like when you see that elongated stair fall that Vincent does, can a stunt double. Um, he did that in the first take. He didn't even make it down the first step. He went, bruh, bruh, and got hung up on the railing. And the way he took off, like you can see in the way, like he... He goes, he's like, here we go, no fear. Um, he had to do that twice. 
And on the second one, that take that you see in the movie, that is, there's no stitching. It is 100% real. We cut when he stopped rolling. It is uh, the second take, all in, no digital effects other than wiping out the, the camera that was tracking him down. It was on a cable cam. So we actually brought the cable down and the guys on the control trying to keep up with Vincent. So and you don't know because you that's a hard one to rehearse. You just kind of go, I think this is going to work. You run the radius at three, two, one, let's go. Um, so what he did on that was just, and like that was literally human talent. Vincent put on very standard stunt gear and just had the heart of a lion and just went, okay, I'm going and I'm going to make it a hunt. We, we, I wasn't, but some of the stunt team might have been betting on how many steps he would have made, and no one, no one thought he was going to make it down past halfway, and he went just past halfway. He went about sixty-five percent of the way down the stairs, oh, to two hundred and twenty steps, and he did it all on the on the second take. Pretty impressive. It, it's actually, I, I, my jaw was, you know, that's one of those things. That's the thing about the John Wick movies is that every one of these, I'm always like, you know, the jaw goes down, and but I think that's one of the reasons why, like, the world loves these movies is because you guys are constantly doing stuff like that otherwise you get bored right without complication is boredom i guess I'll, i'm going to end this with um we've talked a little bit but um about what you want to do next mm -hmm. this is obviously this movie makes it that you're literally going to do something else because mm -hmm. well you are um so what for fans of yours what do you think might be next um like look the john wick Property is always interesting to us. There's always different ways to go, and we're always working with Lionsgate to try and come up with like, okay, how do we continue this great journey we're on? So there's, I'm always open to that. Whether it was TV, anime, a continuation of the John Wick franchise, whatever, like that's always on the table. We're always happy to help out with that. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple great properties going on right now. I'm attached to Black Samurai with with Netflix and with Rainbow Six with Paramount and Michael B. Jordan, which is super exciting. Um, and then, uh, you know, Ghost of Tsushima, which is, um, you know, I can't say enough good things about just even the story that, that that property has to it. If you told me tomorrow I had to do any one of the three, I'd be very happy to jump right in and go. You know, I'm sure you understand Hollywood as much as anybody. It's that magic algorithm of cast availability. We have a property that we think is, you know, probably of success is very high. Timing works out timing is good resources are great we have everything we let's go and somebody to say agree and on all those properties we have all these things going forward plus there's a bunch of tv things I, I'd, I'd love to jump into the tv world a little bit and try that but um <clears throat> you know my heart's really into the three properties i just talked about because one's more of a sci-fi thing more worlds more is one is a, a, a real life kind of chance to expand on something that would be ours and one is you know a love letter to everything i know about martial arts and samurai and subversive storytelling and you know basically making an art film about everything i love so that that's where kind of my head's at on that note i just want to say a sincere thank you for making these movies oh. and i really uh, i'm being serious thank you and uh, i really look forward to whatever you do next thanks man and thank you guys for your support